system. We talked about this really from last Sunday. If you remember, John came on the, the six o'clock news on Sunday, said this was gonna be trouble. And sure enough, it was pretty big trouble. Uh, and it was probably as advertised, if not a little bit above what was advertised with the system. A pretty remarkable storm in a variety of ways. Uh, it happened in November. First November hurricane to strike the east coast of Florida since the Yankee hurricane of 1935. It's the second latest hurricane strike in recorded history in the state of Florida. We had Hurricane Kate that impacted the panhandle of Florida in very late November. So this is a very, very rarefied system and the size of it. We had a, 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 a tropical storm force wind field at one time of almost 500 miles wide. So this was a huge system. Definitely gonna be a memorable system for many, especially if you live along the beaches and you live along the St. John's River and some of the tributaries like the Trout River and the Rebalt River because we had some significant flooding above Ian and some of us had flooding levels uh, very, very similar to what we, or not to Irma levels, but definitely the highest levels we've seen since Irma uh, with the system. So you just came here from Central Florida. Yes. And so you understand that market well. You've seen what happened to the Volusia County coastline all the way up to Flagler, up to Northeast Florida where you work now and yes. where you've been um, forecasting these storms. So. Um, tell me a little bit about your perspective, having just, you know, moved up I-4 and I-95. Yeah, so, I mean, one big thing here, or one, it's, it's very, very remarkable. We got hit with two hurricanes this year, 43 days apart. You probably saw the meme that was floating around on social media. Charlie and Gene back in 2004, also 43 days apart. So kind of some, some bizarre numbers there with our systems. Uh, one of the big takeaways, I think, with, with Nicole down in Central Florida was just the damage that we're getting now, or we're seeing, down into parts of Volusia County. It's Daytona Beach shores, uh, Wilbur by the Sea, uh, downtown, or the Daytona Beach area proper. Uh, we're talking about not just homes, but large condo buildings that are going to be torn down. They are structurally now on sound. You've seen the videos of the homes with the sunrooms, and some, in, case, in some cases, the patios. They're in the ocean now. There is half of a home there instead of a full-fledged home. And so that's a big takeaway for me because if you've been to Daytona Beach, you've been to Volusia County, one thing they're known for is they're incredibly wide beaches. You can drive on these beaches. You can't do that in some of the other areas like Brevard County. It's, the beaches just aren't wide enough. The sand is, isn't compacted enough. So to see not only the ocean cover all that, but then to come up and start taking apart homes businesses and even underpinning or even taking some of the underpinnings of these high-rise condos out to sea very very remarkable with this system and i think that's going to be one of the more memorable effects of nicole down in central florida not so much a rain event but the damage it did in volusia county for sure all right so let's get to the nitty-gritty of yes. why nicole was so bad so one thing that we talk about a lot during hurricane season you see it, especially if we get into may and june is not all hurricanes are the same. It doesn't matter how many hurricanes you've been through. If you even talk to meteorologists who've been here 30, 40 years, like a John gone, he will tell you every single storm is different. That's one thing that we always hammer home. But every storm has a similarity in it in how the hurricane is actually structured. And some of you may have heard of this. This is actually the hurricane quadrants. In fact, you can come over here. We got a, a graphic ready to go. And we'll talk about how these quadrants all work out because that is a real key with the hurricanes themselves. So there's four quadrants to a hurricane and it's based on the storm direction. So if the storm is moving towards the east, this, this would be the actual northern side of the system. If the storm was moving towards the north, this would be the eastern side of the system. And so the front right is the most active part of a hurricane. That's where you get what we call the maximum hurricane impact we're talking about significant storm surge, significant wind, and significant wave activity. Now the front left can also have significant storm surge as well, depending on the exact angle of attack with the coastline, uh, but the, it, the surge is not nearly as prevalent as it is in the front right. The back right has significant wind with it because of the, how the hurricane is approaching the coastline. That's where the winds can really roar. And then the back left is actually the weakest quadrant of the hurricane, but it is still quite dangerous. And you can actually almost divide this, and, and, and not just in quadrants, but almost divide it in two, where this side is the active side, and this side is what we call the clean side, or sometimes known as the dry side. So let's compare the two. So we'll compare what happened a few weeks ago with Ian 
versus Nicole. Now, I don't have to say Ian was a significant hit to Florida. You saw the damage in Fort Myers Beach. By the time it got towards our area, it was a high-end tropical storm, and then it actually be redeveloped to a Category 1 hurricane. But one thing I want you to notice here is the actual track. Notice this track did this. That kept us on what's called the clean side of the hurricane. So Ian had an eastern path, which resulted in less wind and less rain for us. We still had some flooding rainfall, especially down in the parts of Flagler, Volusia County, no doubt about it, but that was much, much closer to the actual path of the system. And the other factor was, while we did have storm surge, we did have issues along the St. Johns River and the tributaries, we had more of a north to northwesterly wind as the system worked its way through. And that resulted in still a surge event, but not the extreme surge we would have seen and the extreme, and the extreme wind that actually occurred out here in the open waters of the Atlantic. Now, before we can talk about Nicole, we got to talk about what happened earlier in the week, and that was a nor'easter that got going. We had a pressure gradient between an area of high pressure up here in the southeast and Nicole down here towards the south, and that allowed the winds to just roar in, especially in the sections of northeast Florida. What that did was cause significant beach erosion. So a lot of the dunes were already beginning to see reduced levels because they'd been taking this wind for a couple of days. And then we also had some high tides that had gotten trapped, especially in some of the upper bounds here of the St. Johns River near the Mayport area. So that was a recipe that was already in place for Nicole to really do damage. And then Nicole ended up taking a western path away from Jacksonville. Again, not anywhere near us, but it put us on the active side. So we had a lot of wind and storm surge with this activity. We were, got lucky. Uh, Nicole drug in a lot of dry air as it worked its way into North Florida. So we actually got what we call dry slotted. You notice that in the afternoon where we had a big slot here of dry air across Jacksonville and Northeast Florida. That's why we didn't see the profound rainfall numbers. But then we also had those strong North and northeasterly winds. We had those huge high tides right along the coastline. And then we also had some significant tidal flooding down the St. Johns River. Actually, St. Johns River is more like this. Uh, down the St. Johns River as well. And the tidal cycles are going to continue. That's going to be a big storyline here today, heading into the weekend. You can see this area of red. That's still the report of moderate flooding along the coastline. And so we're working our way through the high tide cycle this afternoon. We're gonna have another high tide cycle, it looks like, as we head to the evening hours. So very similar to Ian with the St. John's River, it's gonna take some time for the water's levels to recede. The good news in all of this is because we didn't pick up those blockbuster rainfall numbers in parts of Volusia County and down in Seminole County, we're not gonna be talking about elevated river levels from water, it's just gonna be elevated river levels from tidal flooding. That will begin to fade away as we head into the early part of next week. So even though Nicole was a significantly weaker system, category one storm, we compared to Ian, which land, made landfall as a category four storm, you can see the impacts here in Jacksonville were very similar. And for some of us, especially if you live right along the river or right along the beaches, the impact's actually a little bit worse than Ian. So that is one of the key, I think, takeaways here from Nicole is every storm is different. And sometimes the weather conditions before a hurricane, the nor'easter in our case, really set the stage here for what happened with Nicole. That's some awesome perspective. Um, I think we heard from a lot of news for Jack's viewers yesterday saying, this feels worse than Ian. And, and it was for a lot of us. You know, there, even here at our TV station for Broadcast Place, uh, we had some minor flooding issues with Ian during some high tides back near what we call our employee parking lot. There's a little neighborhood back there that does flood. It's connected to the St. John's River. Uh, that water was significantly higher in the midday hours, came almost all the way up towards the uh, front entrance to our main, our guest employee, par or our guest parking lot. And so here just at the TV station, we saw a significant rise in water. And a lot of the other neighborhoods like Riverside, like San Marco, they saw water levels higher than what we dealt with with Ian. Or with Ian. And then we had that significant rain band that really roared through the area in the morning time period. Again, Ian put us on the clean side of the storm. So while we had some wind and rain, we didn't have that roaring rain band that a lot of us woke up to in the morning hours here in Jacksonville. So yeah, we definitely had impacts similar to, if not above Ian. A lot of that was based though exactly on where you lived. David Hegger, thank you so much for your insight. We'll see you later on Channel 4. All right.